So welcome everyone and thank you very much for coming um, and welcome to the, I suppose the second series of um, the research cluster uh, of your and I uh, called directing and um, before we start, um, yes, as as you, oh, okay, no. did you pause the recording? Oh, now it's going on. No, okay, yes. So yes, we are recording the uh, the session, and we will upload the recording on the website later on, and because there are quite a few people who couldn't join us um, in person here, and um, just a uh, housekeeping matters. Um, so yes, the recording and. Also, uh, after I introduce the speaker, and also today we have a brilliant respondent, and Sofia is going to give a, a talk, and then Julia is going to respond um, briefly, and then we will um, open to the floor, and then um, please, um, any comments or uh, feedback would be welcome. And you can raise your hand using the reaction function on Zoom, or physically raise hands, um, so that hopefully I can see you. Or um, put a comment in the uh, in the chat, and then I can read it out to you too. Okay, so I, I would like to sh um, share first of all uh, this series of where is that? Um, so this is a the cluster, a research cluster called Religion. I hope you're looking at my screen. Religion challenge and change. And this is the seminar series called Decolonizing Knowledge. And uh, we have like three um, papers and today some offers. And next one is uh, actually myself. And the third one is um, in May um, about the Malabar rebellions as well. And the, the idea is, um, I'm sure you, you have heard of um, the, the decolonizing the curriculum uh, approaches um, in the UK institutions and we are trying to go beyond um, West or Eurocentric um, approaches and also looking at uh, the colonial history and how that has impacted uh, uh, the way we think about um, history and cultures and traditions and also the connection or disconnection uh, that uh, Ophira is going to discuss today. And hopefully um, this will be a thought-provoking series. And then um, please come back um, to any of the series. So um, today um, we are going to have Dr. Dr. Ophira Gamariel, and she's a religious studies scholar specializing in South Asian religions, languages, and cultures with focus on the Malabar coast, Kerala history and culture, and the Malayalam language. Her work lies at the interface between linguistics and anthropology, cultural studies and social history, environmental humanities and performance studies. She published many articles on a wide range of topics from the language and literature of Kerala Jews to the ritual structures in shared festivals. Ophira's most recent publication is a linguistic survey of the Malayalam language in its own terms, and she's currently working on the book Judaism in South India, 900 to 1950s, relocating Malabar Jewry, seeking to situate Kerala Jewish history in the broader context of Indian Ocean Maritime Trade Networks. And today I'm very fortunate that we have a discussant res respondent, um, Dr. Julia McClue. Uh, she's a global historian of the early modern period, specializing in the history of poverty and charity in the context of the Spanish Empire and the Franciscan networks ac at, across the Atlantic Ocean. She published numerous articles examining the intersections between economic structures and inequality, intellectual history and religious networks, colonial expansion and racial ideologies. Her work ties ideas of poverty and charity with empire and colonial expansion, shedding light on the intertwined mechanism of development and exploitation impacting the great divide between the global South and North. Her forthcoming book, Empire of Poverty, The Moral Economy of the Spanish Empire, explores how concept and institution of poverty were central to the legitimization, governance and business of empire. So today um, I'm very 
um, want us to welcome one of my um, dear colleagues, Dr. Ophira Gamriya, talking at, about disconnected histories, Muslims and Jews between Malabar and the Arab world, 1500s to 1800s. Thank you very much. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Saiko, for this uh, nice introduction. And thank you all of you for uh, joining us. Uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing your thoughts, uh, especially Julia, but also we will have the uh, discussion, I hope, uh, after that. So um, what first, let's start with connected histories. I suppose many of you already know uh, the term and know uh, who coined it and know this article, Connected Histories, Notes Towards a Reconfiguration of Early Modern Eurasia. Uh, it was uh, published by Sanjay Subramaniam in 1997, uh, where he argues very strongly against the uh, historical approach that was prevalent at the time uh, to examine the histories of regions separately from each other. And he says, you can't really understand historical processes if you don't examine the connections, which is of course a very appealing idea. And all of us uh, in the field of um, South Asian studies and the Indian Ocean history, Sanjay Subramanian is basically an Indian Ocean historian specializing uh, in the Portuguese empire. Uh, all of us are very much still enchanted by this idea of connections. Uh, so just a few examples how uh, still prevalent this uh, ideas and this notion of connected histories and scholars are looking after the lost connections, so to speak. So for example, Amsterdam uh, University Press has a book series uh, called Connected Histories in the Early Modern Period. Uh, it is advertised uh, by this uh, nice image on the website showing uh, Europeans and South Europeans or Asians and Africans together in an image adoration of the Magi um, to start thinking about how Africa, Asia and Europe were connected in the early modern period. So this is one example. Another example of a historian and a material culture historian that um, I really admire, Elizabeth Lamborn, is uh, her engagement with the connected histories between uh, the Arabic speaking world and the, the Islamic world in South Asia and Southeast Asia. So for example, you can uh, watch a wonderful uh, presentation by her during the, one of the lockdowns, Wondrous Worlds Connected, Life at Sea in the Islamic World. Uh, really engaging and beautiful. And in that presentation, she says, look, I don't go beyond the 16th century. And to be frank, I also don't like to go beyond the 16th century. And this is the period in which uh, we can start talking about these connections. And one of the questions I started asking myself in the past uh, two, three years, ever since I started thinking about disconnected histories, is why actually are we so fascinated and enchanted by this idea of connections? That in itself says something, no? It says that we in the 21st century, uh, are still kind of feeling this awe at discovering and uh, unearthing connections uh, before the modern period, before the colonial period, uh, as if it was some kind of impossibility. So I started thinking about, okay, we actually live in a period of that of disconnections that takes it, you know, as if it is not to be taken for granted that there were global connections and international connections in the past. And uh, when I started thinking, I, I started writing an article, I never finished it, but I started writing a, an article sometime before the <laughs> first lockdown. Uh, and I thought, okay, it can't be that no historian, especially South Asian historians, uh, never thought about this idea of disconnected histories. And I was Googling, and then I found this article by a South Asian historian, Indrani Chatterjee, uh, connected histories and the dream of decolonial history. And in that article, the, she mentioned disconnected history several times. And basically, she's, she's writing about um, the northeast uh, part of uh, India, South Asia, if you like, uh, Tibet, Nepal, what today we uh, term Tibet, Nepal, and uh, Assam. And she argues that during the British times, 
uh, the colonial regime started separating the, those entities that were actually quite fluid and on the same continuum, uh, defining languages for each group and religion. She found in 17th century documents, for example, that the kings in that region, the continu continuum between Ladakh, uh, Nepal, and Assam were Hindu Buddhists. They were not either Hindu or Buddhist, they were both. And that was a very interesting observation uh, from my point of view. And she was with, with a certain amount of a pain, you know, uh, thinking, can we ever re rediscover this kind of history that not that far ago, 17th century, in which there were no such clear uh, borderlines between those different entities, not in terms of language, not in terms of culture, not in terms of religion. And I started thinking from my own perspective about the dissonances that such disconnections uh, over history uh, cause uh, and some concepts and, and constructs that we have in mind that we, we don't really think about much, for example, uh, the idea of a Judeo-Christian heritage, you can find in academic articles such expressions. These are clear constructs. And my feeling is that there is a dissonance there because why don't we speak about Judeo-Christian Muslim heritage? These are such close uh, religions. And yesterday I heard a lecture by uh, Lloyd Regan, I think he's also here. Uh, he was also mentioning this concept of al kitab I am not entirely sure whether, you know, this is the concept of inclusivity or exclusivity or a little bit of both, but the idea that in the Muslim world, there is this concept of people of the book for at least the three religions, uh, perhaps also different ways of differentiating between Muslims and the other monotheist religions, but there is a tendency to become inclusive with that and include more religions in that kind of construct of al kitab So there are different possibilities in viewing, for example, the connections between different uh, religious cultures. Uh, and still I am wondering uh, what happened to the Muslims in this equation of Judeo-Christian heritage. Now, um, I'm going to talk about my own field a little bit and uh, very, a little bit narrative uh, or narrow, uh, sorry, a bit narrow uh, perspective that I take on this. Um, the broader picture is of Indian Ocean connections. And uh, as you can see, uh, that's another dissonance by the way, because we talk about Indian Ocean maritime trade routes but in most maps you will not see the Silk Road trade routes and some of the travelers in pre-modern times and I think also later used to go through all those regions uh, so there's a circle there uh, but my perspective is on this specific uh, point the Malabar coast the western uh, coast of South India that used to be a uh, Transregional uh, crossroads and traders from the Arabic speaking world and uh, East Africa used to uh, come here before continuing to South Asia and to China. So it was a very, very important uh, trade hub. It was also very rich uh, in the you know, up to the, let's say, 16th century and probably even a little bit later than that. And that specific region that I was studying and still do, the Malayalam speaking region, uh, begins to develop its identity as a region and as a state formation in the mid 9th century in a small port town uh, called Kolam or Quilam, uh, down there near the tip of the subcontinent. And we have the document, a very interesting document from uh, 849. Uh, in Malayalam, it's also the second oldest Malayalam record that we have. Uh, it's a land grant. It has nothing to do with religion, except that in the beginning, God is mentioned in the context of the agricultural uh, workers and laborers that have to give something to their God before they pay the, <coughs> the village uh, authorities. 
Uh, and at the end, the God that is going to protect this document for generations to come. But otherwise, it's a financial document. And one of the reasons it is uh, so interesting is because we have two plates out of six plates in which there are signatures in uh, West Asian languages, first Arabic, Kufic Arabic, very nicely engraved, a, a list of names witnessing this grant. And then we have Pahlavi less nicely engraved of Zoroastrian and Muslim names, apparently. And finally, four Hebrew names in the Hebrew script, which is really messed up. It looks like the scribe saw the Hebrew characters for the first time. And this, when you read this document, you are to understand that this is the emergence of a trade network. And you see that these trade networks in the mid 9th century had people from different ethnicities, uh, different regions, different languages, and different religions. But that was no issue in collaborating. And by the way, um, I'm not so sure, you know, if we look at the Hindu names and the, uh, the not the Hindu, the South Indian names and the South Indian uh, people involved and entities involved, I'm not so sure all of them were Hindus. And at that period, most probably some of them were Jain, some of them were uh, Buddhist as well. So it's a multi-religious uh, trade network. And indeed we have more documents from the next centuries that show us what is happening in that region in that sense we have it's it's actually the only region in south asia and southeast East asia where jewish communities um, emerged uh, during the 14th century and indeed uh, from between the 11th and the, the 13th century the end of the 13th century we have the records uh, from the amazing discovery, which is called the Geniza records. Anybody needs a little bit of explanation about what the Geniza is? Or I can proceed. This is a stash of documents that were <laughs> discovered in Egypt in a synagogue chamber that was never, uh, you know, everybody was called holy trash. Everything written in Hebrew was pushed there. And among the manuscripts found there were uh, records, uh, business records of Jewish traders from medieval times. So this is the Geniza and these are records in the Hebrew script, but it's actually Arabic. And uh, in those business letters and documents, uh, we also find Malayalam words and other Indian languages and place names, lots of place names of the port towns where those Jewish traders were heading to. And the same places mentioned in the Geniza also appear in many, many Arabic travelogues and navigational texts, et cetera, et cetera. So this west coast of South India is the port towns and the connections are reflected in the business records in Judeo-Arabic as well. So this is the picture of connections uh, until the 15th century, more or less. And what happens on the Malabar coast in terms uh, uh, of politics and political entities? Uh, we have first the emergence of Venad, the region where Kolam, the port town, is. And Kolam is a very, very important port town in the Geniza records and in the Arab travelogue as well. Uh, it is ruled by uh, Tiruvadi rulers. And this Tiruvadi, uh, their name appears uh, as the sultans of Kolam in Ibn Battuta's uh, travelogue as Al Tiravari. So we can say that there is a continuous rule of the same rulers since the ninth century. Uh, next uh, is the port of Calicut that emerges uh, in the 14th century, around the 14th century, with a ruler dynasty uh, called Nediripu dynasty uh, that had an alliance with Muslim and Arabic speaking traders, also Persians, I guess, and Ottomans, but mainly uh, uh, traders from merchants from Arabia, from Yemen and uh, other places in the uh, Arabic speaking world. And he's called Samudri Raja. This, uh, those kings from the Nedi Iripu dynasty, they supported the port of Calicut. They had business with the Muslim traders. 
Uh, and th therefore they were called Samudri means ocean in uh, Sanskrit. So king of the ocean, Samudri Raja. In Arabic, uh, their name is Sameri. And in Portuguese, it becomes Zamorin. Keep it in mind, uh, there is a reason why I bother you with those little details. And finally, uh, around the 15th, the late, uh, no, mid uh, 15th century, we have another uh, dynasty of rulers called the Perumpadapu Rajas, and they are rivals of the Zamorin, and probably they also came from the north. At first, they have their own kingdom somewhere inland, uh, and they don't get along with the Zamorin. They become the rulers of Cochin in a later period, in the Portuguese period, actually. Uh, but the point is that Cochin as a poor town emerges in the mid 14th century when Ibn Battuta uh, reaches Kerala, which is the Malabar coast, and he travels between Calicut and Kolam. Uh, he mentions Punjakari, which is probably Kochangadi, the old name of Cochin. So we have three rulers in the beginning of the 16th century or the end of the 15th century. Uh, two of them are in constant rivalry and the last one is well situated in a well-established uh, poor town. So this is the picture that emerges. When in 1498, Vasco da Gama, who wanted to find Calicut and who wanted to find the Malabar coast because it was so rich and famous for uh, its trade, lands in Calicut. Uh, this is an image of Calicut, but actually in the imagination of some painters. And um, probably it's not Calicut, but another place called Shaliam, very nearby. Uh, but it doesn't matter for uh, our purposes. The most important thing is when the Portuguese land in Calicut and uh, go to meet the ruler, the Zamorin, they tell him that they came for Christians and pepper. And this is basically where I locate the a change, I should say, in the way that the trade networks were organized uh, in the centuries that uh, preceded this point in time, uh, that you have religious interests and zeal integrated into trade and business in, in, in a new, I think, way, and in a way that also shapes uh, the early modern trade networks and causes not only connections and new connections, but also disconnections. And above all, the disconnecting of Muslims from the international uh, trade routes. And the Zamorin of Calicut tells the, uh, the Portuguese tell the Zamorin uh, of Calicut uh, that uh, they are happy to do business with him, but the, on, under the condition that he stops trading with the Muslims, the Zamorin refuses, they become violent. <laughs> there starts a rivalry between the Portuguese and the Zamorin and his, and his Muslim allies that's going to continue for the next two or three, uh, next one and a half centuries that the Portuguese are in the region. Uh, so they go to Cochin, uh, they land in Cochin, and they um, forge an alliance with the Perumpadapuraja, the king of Cochin. As you know, he was a rival of the Zamorin, so he becomes the protégé of the Portuguese against the Zamorin of Calicut, and they build in Cochin a fort in 1503, another date that's worthwhile to keep in mind. This is an image uh, of Cochin, probably by a British uh, painter by the way. Okay, and at this point, uh, I would like to go back to the Islamic and Arabic networks in the region. Um, Malabar Coast, in terms of the uh, culture of the Muslim communities there, is very much integrated in the Arabic world, Arabic-speaking world. Uh, but we don't know precisely when Arabic literature began to be composed in the region. And this is a very preliminary uh, timeline. I am working on that with an Arabist colleague from uh, Munster, Ines Weinrich. Um, and she helped me out with uh, preparing this timeline. Uh, so for example, the earliest known to us at least, uh, 
independent indigenous Arabic composition is towards the end of the 15th century by Abu Bakr ibn Ramadan al-Shaliyati. Al-Shaliyati, Shaliyam or Chaliyam, that is the image that you saw uh, two slides ago that is depicted as calicate, that is Shaliyam. So this is somebody who was in that region uh, working and operating from that region, probably also born there. Uh, the next is uh, two decades after all this trouble with the Portuguese begin, uh, and this is uh, the Mancus Maulid. Uh, Maulid, uh, for those of you who don't know, Maulid is a devotional uh, poetry uh, in honor of the Prophet Muhammad and recited during celebrations to the Prophet. And my colleague Ines Weinrich says, and she's an expert on Maulid literature and Maulid networks. It's, it's a form of networking system as well, literary networks. She says that in the Arabic speaking world, you find Maulid only uh, dedicated to the Prophet Muhammad. And what is happening in Kerala, the more they start, comp they compose Maulids, uh, you find Maulids to the Prophet's family members and you find Maulids to some other characters in a very interesting way. So this is a devotional poem composed by Zainuddin Makdum the first in 1521. Uh, and again, this is a period, decades of very violent clashes with the Portuguese. They start a Carthazus um, regime. They don't let anybody trade uh, as it used to be in the past, uh, they intercept boats uh, with people who have not, who didn't receive, with merchants who didn't receive uh, the Portuguese approval to trade pepper, etc., etc., in Cochin definitely, but also in other areas. And in 1576, we are not absolutely sure about this date. This is a conjectural date. Uh, Another piece of poetry in Arabic is composed in Calicut. Uh, it's called Al-Fatah Al-Mubin. It is composed by uh, Muhammad ibn Qadi Abdel Aziz. Also with a question mark, we are not sure about it because we didn't find the, the manuscripts yet. So we have to really do a good uh, kind of philological old fashioned uh, work into finding those details. Uh, this is a piece of poetry, but the contents are not devotional. The contents are addressing Arab uh, and Ottoman rulers um, in West Asia, calling them to come for the, uh, to the aid of the local uh, Muslim communities against the onslaught of the Portuguese. Uh, and soon enough, another one is composed. Again, it is a conjectural date, 1583 a very, very famous composition in prose, not poetry, which is called Tahfat al-Mujahideen by Zainuddin uh, Makdum II. I think he is the grandson of the first. And uh, this one is very famous because it uh, includes also historical passages that often scholars relate to. And one of the important historical passages is uh, retelling or a narrative of a legend about Cheraman Perumal, a legendary king that the Muslims in the region, uh, Zainuddin Makdum II uh, writes, uh, say, uh, believe that he saw Muhammad uh, performing the miracle of the moon um, in the seventh century and he was very much impressed and fell in love with the prophet and went all the way to Mecca, converted to Islam. And on his way back, he fell ill and wrote a will uh, to the petty kings of Malabar to divide the kingdom. And this is the story of the division of Malabar, the conversion of a king, a Hindu king to Islam and his pilgrimage to Mecca and death out of the country, far away. But Zainuddin Makdum says, this is nonsense. It couldn't have happened, that this is his perspective. And this is close to the uh, end of the 16th century. And in the beginning of the 17th century, we have the earliest uh, composition, which is in Arabic Malayalam, the language medium of the Muslim communities of the Malabar coast to this day. Uh, within Mala, it, Mala means also Maulud, so it's a form of local, a Dravidianized form of uh, the word Maulud, and it is composed in favor of the famous uh, uh, Muhyiddin uh, Abdel Qadir al-Jilani, 
a devotional poem. And one of the questions I would like to ask and uh, try to figure out what is happening is how the literary networks that also are related to religion, how they gradually respond and react with this new uh, entity in the region, the Portuguese, and what kind of history can we learn from this uh, progression from the texts, et cetera, et cetera, and especially how come we see the emergence of Arabic Malayalam in that period. My hunch is that they needed to cultivate closer uh, relations with the Hindus in the region, and therefore they, start, they continued writing in Arabic, but the language is Malayalam, so when it is performed, uh, the people at the court or their neighbors or the market town understand what they are saying. And finally, and now we are uh, in the British period, in the British period, the colonial uh, officer asks um, a scholar in the Balabar Coast, we don't know whom because we don't have any credits, but we have manuscripts in the British Library of a text called Kisa Chakarvati Farmaz in Arabic, Parts of it are very good, fine Arabic. Parts of it are really colloquial Arabic, telling the story of this Hindu king who converted to Islam. Uh, but this one is taking it very seriously. And uh, in order to try and understand the perspective of the local communities on the disconnections imposed on them by the Portuguese uh, regime, um, my colleagues, uh, Psycho and Ines, you can see them in the picture here in 2019, just before the pandemic, uh, we managed to get a small grant for a pilot project to start uh, looking into what kind of archives we have on the Malabar coast in the Arabic language. And we reached the, this is the team in, in Kerala, Shiju Alex and Ajmal Muin Kodiatur and the digitization team, Sajiv and Munir and Fasil, working very hard already the second year of digitization. And in the archives of this wonderful scholar, uh, Ali Tangal uh, in Matul in Northern Kerala, it's even north, northern to Calicut, uh, we found this amazing little text uh, called Maulid Tajadin al-Hindi al-Malabari, and they call it Sheraman Mala. It is Arabic, Dravidianized Arabic, but it is Arabic, it's not Arabic Malayalam. And this is the Arabic name of this legendary king, uh, Cheraman uh, Perumal. Now, what is the point? Why am I telling you all this? There is a core legend about uh, a king that converts to Islam, Hindu king, and that divides the kingdom. And this core language so far, core legend so far, was thought to represent the Muslim uh, communities of the Malabar coast. But we, we have also versions in Malayalam, <laughs> several of them. And the interesting thing is about this Maulid Tajadin al-Hindi al-Malabari, not only that it is a Maulid for a Hindu king and not Muhammad, this is one thing, but the other thing is that it actually tells a, a different story than the Kisa Chakarvati Farmaz, which is a prose text. It tells that this king converted to Islam because he committed a grave sin. He executed some, uh, one of his, uh, uh, as a chief of arms, uh, because his wife was slandering about this commander, and that was the wrong thing to do. And this is the Malayalam version from the court of the Zamorin. So basically, we have one Arabic version of this legend, which is in favor of the Cheraman Perumal and says, oh, this, this was a good pious king. Another one uh, in Malayalam says, no, 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 this one, uh, he was actually offensive and that's why he converted to Islam in order to atone for his sin. Uh, and it seems that there are different groups of people telling the same legends from different perspectives and that this legend can lead us to under better understanding of what was happening in the region uh, between the different communities and different types of alliances. So there were Muslims that were working with the King of Cochin who was collaborating with the Portuguese. And there were Muslims who were working with the Zamorin, who was against the Portuguese. And now uh, I'll just need a few more minutes and I'm nearly the end. The thing about this legend is that it traveled all the way from Malabar uh, and 
to Italy, to Florence, where there was a, a Hebrew scholar. His name was Yohanan Alemano. Alemano means that he was a migrant from Germany. Actually, his parents were migrants from Germany. And this Yohanan Alemano was a mystic and a messianist, but also, a in a way, a geographer. And he was teaching Hebrew to the children of a family of financiers and bankers, the Jewish bankers, the, the Pisa family from Florence. One of the reasons I really asked uh, Julia to join us because now it starts connecting to her <laughs> research. Uh, so Yohanan Alemano was busy writing uh, various types of prophecies and ideas about finding lost ten tribes and discovering, you know, the new world and the old world, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Since uh, 1498, he composed uh, a text called Likutim. It's notes. It's notebooks. And Yohanan Alemano, in one of his uh, uh, see the, the margins of one of his pages, he adds in a new ink in 1503, this is the date. Remember that this date is the date that the Portuguese established their uh, fort in Cochi. And this is the story that Yohanan Alemano tells in Florence, what he heard of things that he collected. When they, Portuguese, traveled the Indian Ocean, they found places full of Muslims. One is a big city called Calicut, and its ruler is very great. Another nearby kingdom is called Cochin. Near Cochin, there is a country 15 days walk long. Now, until he starts talking about this country 15 days uh, walk long, this is quite factual. There is Cochin, there is Calicut, and there are the Portuguese. And then he starts imagining a kingdom of Jews. This 15 days walk long country is all populated by Jews, he says. The king is called Joseph, and this is a messianic trope at that period. Yeah, Joseph is the king, the older brother of David, the Messiah. This is part of the mystical uh, writings networks of Jews in that period. And his capital is called Chingli. Uh, I don't want to get into too many details what Chingli is, but it is a legendary place, definitely. They are black and white like the Indians. Now, not the shift. Now we start talking about color. And color is the first step. Skin color is the first step towards uh, race and racial differentiation. And they are free of all tax. And here comes business into the picture. They are of the tribes of Judea and Benjamin. And now we are back to the Bible and all kinds of connections since biblical times. All the pepper comes from that country. And remember what Vasco da Gama was looking for when he reached Calicut was Christians and pepper. And the Jew in Florence is thinking about Jews and pepper. Isn't it interesting? The Jews gather and sell it mostly in Cochin and especially to four mighty Muslim merchants who are settled there and who pay taxes to the king so that no man could buy from the Jews except for them in Cochin. And they sell it to the Portuguese. I think those of you with a little bit of business instincts can realize what the problem is here, right? The Portuguese want to trade directly, according to Alemano, yes? They want to trade directly with those Jews who are allies, in a way, in, that, in Alemano's mind, right? But there are Muslims that disturb this trade, that are in the middle of the way. And he goes on a, a little bit further uh, down the text the next page, and he tells this fantastic story. At that time, all the land of Malibar and the land of Calicut and the land of Cochin are all at the hands of one king of Edianai, Prester John. This is the Hebrew name of Prester John. So we have tribes, we have Bible, and now we have the Prester John, the imaginary king of Christian kingdom somewhere out there in India or anywhere else. I think Julia and I saw also Kirsty here probably know much more about it than, than I do. But the thing is that you see, I circled it in red here because it looks like he started writing a different name, erasing it. And I suspect that he started writing the name of Cheraman Perumal. I have no way to prove it. But I think that he kind of gave up. He didn't understand what he was told. So he decided to write, okay, that's Prester John. 
the king, you see, this is the division of the kingdom. There is one kingdom, this king, the king gave to each king his own city. To the king Samari, he gave the city of Calicut. Now, this is very important that he says Samari and not Zamorin. It means that he heard this story from an Arabic speaker, probably a Jew, but from an Arabic speaker. To Rabbi Samuel, he gave Shingli. To King Beveli, I couldn't figure out yet what it means, he gave Cochin. And we, and this is very important, we Jews, yes, he writes in Hebrew, right? We Jews are favored by the king of Cochin and he is favored by us, but not so the king of Calicut. Now you would have imagined that at this period after the ex uh, expulsions from the Iberian Peninsula, Jews will be afraid of Portuguese, right? Or Iberian people. But it's quite obvious that for these Jews sitting in Florence, the Portuguese are the allies. And they're actually, he wants to work with them. And indeed, uh, and with this, this is my last slide. I hope I didn't take too much time. But indeed, in that period, we see the emergence of what I call religious trade networks in the Western Mediterranean around the beginning of the 16th century. We see uh, more and more legends about Jewish and or Christian kingdoms in the East that are the subject matter of aspiration to reach and unite with. There's actually a nice book about it called The Ten Lost Tribes in World History by a colleague called uh, Tzvi Benite, uh, Bendo Benite. Uh, we see the emergence of mystical scientific intellectual networks, and this is something I would like to have a good project about it because we need people uh, reading and uh, knowing, you know, the uh, several languages and several types of uh, literary uh, cultures uh, of that region. Uh, one example in Hebrew, a language that I can read, is David Reubeni and Shlomo Molcho. David Reubeni is a very strange character. Nobody figured out where he came from, probably from uh, the Eastern Mediterranean, maybe from Arabia. Uh, but he uh, pops up in the Western Mediterranean. He goes to the Pope uh, in the 1520s and demands that the Pope helps him uh, to get an interview with the King of Cochin. And David Reuveni, his story is that he's the younger brother of one King Joseph in a faraway place called, I think, Haibal or something like that. Uh, and that they have a huge kingdom there with a huge, all Jewish kingdom and with a huge army of Jews and they are just waiting to connect with the Portuguese and Christian armies in order to fight against the Muslims. So this is in uh, 1525, he reaches uh, the, the court of the Portuguese king, he meets there in his travelogue, there is the name Shingli and the story about Jews in Shingli, but it's not his knowledge, he hears it from the Portuguese. So this is more or less where I would like to start our discussion, to think about this period. And I hope there are enough people here who know something about those stories and can share it with me. It's, it's a work in progress. It's not, nothing, uh, no conclusion that I can draw at this stage. So thank you for your patience. And I think we can ask uh, for Julia's response. Thank you very much, Ophira. Um, it was really like a rich journey. Um, like really, it was a journey um, of this um, trade route. And not only 300 years, uh, I was thinking now, uh, it actually started with the ninth century or even maybe before. And then not only the Indian Ocean just ended up in Florence. So it was uh, very interesting. Um, I've got quite a few things actually. And also it was nice to, um, for reminding me of our time in Kerala and uh, Ophira kindly uh, let me join her uh, in her journey in Kerala and then we visited various places and then looking at uh, different like, Malit uh, rituals and also the uh, documents as well. So yes, that was very nice. I, I feel like it's almost like a lifetime ago, like anything pre-COVID feels like a long time ago. <laughs> so um, yes, I've got Actually, quite a few um, questions, but I, I would like to give um, the opportunity to Julia to formally uh, respond to the paper. 
Thank you so much. Um, it's great to hear about this, this series and um, thank you, Ophira, for this uh, opportunity to hear more about your work, which we've discussed in passing, and this was a fantastic opportunity to hear more about it. And um, I'm delighted that you've invited me to talk specifically about this uh, provocation that you have about disconnected histories, uh, which I know is what you wanted me to kind of respond about specifically today. Um, so as Seiko had said in, the, in my introduction earlier, um, I'm a global historian. Um, specialising in the late medieval and the early modern period and focusing on uh, the Americas. Now, why I really say that is that I think that those um, temporal and geographical contexts are quite important framing for the kind of comments that, that I have here in relation to this thinking about connected versus disconnected uh, histories. Now, so the subfield of, um, of global history has been on the rise since at least the 1990s and has become, become embedded in um, curricula and so on uh, since the 2000s. Um, and since its inception, the connected histories paradigm has been kind of one of the main genres, as it were, of global history. And so that's kind of the angle that I come at this uh, from. And so when I moved from the University of uh, Warwick, which had a well-established global history center to set global history up here at um, Glasgow in 2017, I had to launch a course and it was called an introduction to global history, connected histories, question mark. And I had to fight pretty hard to put that question mark on. And I think that why I had that question mark, you know, is for some of the kind of things that you introduce here in the presentation so, so nicely. Um, and also perhaps uh, from this perspective that I have of kind of having a foot in both the uh, early modern and the um, medieval world, which I think is a kind of point we can come back to. So I'd argue that um, as a global historian, one of the genealogical uh, roots of this kind of connected histories paradigm is the debt that global history uh, owes to world systems analysis, um, you know, specifically as elaborated by Emmanuel Wallerstein and later Annabel Keanu, who uh, related it more specifically to the Americas, which uh, made us think more critically about uh, global historical processes and the ways in which the world's been connected um, through systems of uh, capitalism and colonialism. However, I think that um, when the connected histories paradigm took off in the 2000s, it kind of departed from that kind of more critical Marxist um, analysis of um, world systems to focus more on the cultural side of economic history. And I know that's definitely been the focus at the center uh, at Warwick, for example, where I was uh, previously. And it was there was kind of a race uh, to, to tell these connected uh, histories, as, as Ophira said in her paper, you know, it's very much about the narrativity of the flows of um, goods and people and the, uh, the resulting cross-cultural um, connections. And as Ophira said in her um, presentation there, this model was cemented uh, for early modernists at least by this influential article by the South Asian historian uh, Sanjay Subramaniam in 1997. Now, I just kind of revisited that paper um, yesterday to, to think about uh, uh, today's uh, presentation. And he was, uh, in this paper, he was targeting in particular Victor Lieberman's uh, first foray into um, South Asian history. And he criticized the methodology that Lieberman had, uh, arguing that he took uh, geographical units as given from conventional wisdom and then proceeding to a high level of comparison using these um, very units as building blocks. That's a citation from the paper. Now Lieberman, for his part, after this uh, earlier publication, went on to develop what, he, what was called the parallel histories uh, model in his 2010 book, Strange Parallels, Southeast Asia in the Global Context. And that work has been um, also very influential in its own right alongside Subramaniam's piece because there's been many kind of um, global histories that have followed this parallel history um, piece. And, and I was in, involved with a, a project by the medievalist um, Charles uh, West that was called Religious Exemption from the State that resulted in a special edition uh, for which I wrote a kind of critical afterward um, a few years back. And I'll put the link to that in the, in the chat in just a moment if anyone's interested. Um, so, it's interesting that, that that kind of parallel history model was of interest to um, medievalists who were thinking about perhaps the ways in which kind of similar institutions emerge in different places that weren't necessarily connected. So kind of approach, um, I would say beyond comparative, but this kind of uh, this parallel approach that was um, you know, foregrounded in, in Lieberman's work. Now, Subramaniam, as I say, you know, he's cementing this um, crucially for early modernists. And I think, you know, you know what what's what comes across in the, in the Subramaniam connected histories model is this is a kind of a, this is an early modern um, conundrum, and I think that that's something this kind of periodization of connectivity 
is something that we can we can explore you know the, this idea that you know the world is becoming more connected is some the teleology of connection is something that i kind of always getting um students uh, to critique and i'm particularly interested in models of the of the global middle ages um and um yeah i um i think subramanian's um connected histories model also indicated perhaps this intellectual debt to world systems um, analysis because he also focused on um, global trade flows and um, the ways that, that these connected the world. But you also made a nod to uh, environmental connections, which I think is, is important for why we need to keep aspects of the connected histories model in, in part of uh, as a part of new global histories and so on. But he also, you know, is the, is the person that foregrounds this uh, shift away from the materialistic conceptions of connectivity that's foregrounded in uh, world systems to these uh, more critical cultural and intellectual contexts, and I see that that's kind of very much there in what you're arguing for in your model as well. And you know, and I would say, kind of as an apology to Subramanian, you know, that's kind of one of the things that he's advocating for. Um, another kind of apology for the uh, the Subramanian uh, model, which is not kind of necessarily what I came here to do, uh, Afira, as, as you know, but. You know, he does say um, it's not kind of conceptualized in a naive way, I would say, this Subramanian model. And so he criticizes the way in which um, the globalization of European epistemologies um, about connectivity, specifically universalism and humanism, um, have, uh, and I quote, not in fact united the early modern world, but instead led to a new or intensifying form of hierarchy, domination and separation. And so it was interesting for me, kind of who's perhaps also like yourself drifted away to kind of criti being critical of this connected histories model, that some of that kind of um, critique, critical awareness was also um, there in this early article. And I, but I think that, you know, some of that kind of the warnings that Subramanian had perhaps have fallen away in the kind of race to write these um, connected global histories that emerged in the 2000s following this, um, this kind of landmark uh, model. And, I, and I'd also um, yeah, argue that it's been important in particular for um, global intellectual history, which has really prioritized this kind of um, ways in which kind of ideas are, are connected. And, and I think that there's a thinking about our connected cultural and intellectual pasts is also important for the project of decolonization, which is what you're also talking about in this group and and again not to plug my own work but i've written an article on connected global intellectual history as a tool of um coloni decolonizing the curriculum and I'll, I'll put that in the chat as well but it's kind of it's you know i don't want to pitch in as, as kind of opposite to, to this i'm going to come to um to at a point of agreement uh, shortly um but to say you know i think that there's uh when we need to critique certain aspects of the connected histories model um, perhaps there are things that are important there and we don't want to sort of throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, for me, as somebody working on poverty and inequality, um, it's really important um, to keep the kind of connected histories model in sight, um, because as we write histories in the context of um, the crises of capitalism and uh, climate, which are you know, the result of connections of colonialism, it's really important to see how the misfortunes of some places and the fortunes of another are connected to keep that politics in sight. So I think there's a kind of political importance to connectivity um, in, in all of this. Um, however, in the last uh, couple of years, I, I would say there has been, you know, more of a, a criticism of the, um, the kind of um, narrative that um, the connected history model has, has prioritized, and I think that's where you're, you're coming from, and I would totally um, agree with you. Um, so, in 2018, Zoltan Biedemann published his Disconnected Empires, Imperial Portugal, Sri Lankan Diplomacy, and the Making of the Habsburg Conquests in Asia. And I think it was actually quite an important step in, in this um, direction. And he articulated the problem that Eurocentric narratives of agency um, have been prioritized by the connections paradigm. And I think that's also the point that you're making that, um, that you know, we see the world as becoming more connected, you know, especially after the year 1500 and the early modern period. But actually what we're seeing there is the prioritization of a European form of connections. Um, so in my own work, uh, you know, I'm also kind of taking 1500 often as a starting point because I work on the Americas, which is the point in which, you know, the Americas become connected to other parts of um, the world. But um, I also think that this point about uh, disconnections is really important because um, from my own work, for example, I'm interested in uh, indigenous history of the Americas, as you know, and of course the moment of, um, you know, the circa 1500s um, uh, colonialism in the Americas is kind of seen as the start of connectivity, but it also causes 
um, multiple disconnections of pre-existing indigenous uh, networks. Um, you know, we think about, we know that about the Aztec Empire and its tributary connections across Central America or the Inca Empire and its uh, connections uh, across the Andes, but below the imperial level, there were many uh, forms of trade networks and uh, intellectual networks and also unfortunately slave networks that were um, actually transcontinental and lost those transcontinental indigenous American networks broke down in the wake of colonialism and led to the kind of impression that, you know, the anthropologists gave of um, indigenous communities being isolated, the idea of the closed corporate community and um, that, you know, was generated by Eric Wolf and so on. And actually that kind of idea is itself the, con the consequence of um, the disconnection caused by the connection of colonialism. And I think that um, that's kind of in, in one of the points that Beadleman's kind of making in his book and the kind of point that I would like to, you know, make an agreement with you um, hear about this need for looking at disconnections. Um, I'm going to end with a, with a provocation, though, um, Ophira, um, as you know, is, uh, is my style. Um, and I'm wondering, um, particularly when you were presenting this, um, you know, beautiful depiction of the Indian Ocean world, um, and then thinking about how, about the periodization of connections and the need, to, you know, to go, to see disconnections, to go away from um, the kind of forms of connection that have been pri prioritized by the um, global histories take on connected histories. I'm wondering, though, um, to what extent is this different from a uh, return to um, the idea of the world systems analysis before European hegemony, um, as proposed by um, Janet Abelugard back in the, uh, the 80s and so on. Um, so this is my final provocation, um, but there's lots to, to discuss here. And I've really enjoyed um, the opportunity to hear more about your, your work as well in this group. Thank you so much for this. And uh, yeah, I'm not a historian, to be frank. <laughs> I'm uh, kind of pulled into it out of frustration because I feel like the history of the region of the Malabar coast and especially the Jews of the region uh, is just, you know, still waiting to be told. And partly because of those disconnections, I, I see it as an issue of networks, networks rising and others declining, but there are also competitions between the networks. But, but we can continue maybe the discussion. I would really like to learn from you all the relevant references and maybe we can uh, continue the discussion after, at some point. But I would really like to hear some uh, comments from the audience. Maybe somebody has questions or comments to make. Uh, yes, so now the floor is open. And so if you have anything uh, you can uh, raise your hand or, but while um, we are waiting, um, could I ask, could I, start because I can as the chair <laughs> and yes thank you very much I, I was um a couple of um um yes question and probably like a comment in a way so at the beginning you mentioned that you know the like Judeo-Christian heritage and then why why not um Judeo-Christian Muslim um heritage and um I, I thought I thought exactly the same thing and then um Part of my research looking at um, this Muslim Jewish relation through this um, 20th century Arab Jewish scholar, um, Shami Huda. Um, and then uh, I'm also looking at um, his um, translation uh, work on Al Andalus and then how Muslim Jews um, co lived. And I remember a discussion we are with my colleague in Israel. And so we agree that um, you know, when we talk about the Muslim Jewish connections or like dialogue or relationship, they still hyphen. And when we look at, for example, Andalus, and I, I suppose this seems to be the, a similar case in India as well. Um, you know, when we say Muslim Jewish um, Christian, even like I connected them with hyphen, there are still three or you know, two different entities. It looks like there's a Jewish community, there's a Muslim community, and then they live together, like together. But I think you know, it's probably, it wasn't like that in and, Andalus and probably I assume in India as well. Like, you know, the, the society is um, diverse and you know, we we just um, interact, we, we do everyday life just regardless of um, whatever the religiosity. So yes, we are wondering if there is a, like, a way to say that, um, even without using hyphen, even without like, putting two together combined, like, you know, just a kind of one word, that, that how it was like, you know, it's, everything was more like merged, like, you know, when we put um, red and white um, paint together, it's not red and white, it becomes different color. So it's almost like, you know, together, it's more like a connection. That, that's one comment. And the, the other one was, um, 
I find it quite interesting uh, when you showed us that the last time Florence one, um, like, you know, there's Jews and there's Muslims and also there's a Portuguese. So I'm interested in that this identity marker, um, so Jews and Muslims, so that's a religion origin and then Portuguese. Um, so is that how they identified people according to the, the religion? Or you know, they, they don't they are not called like Arabs or they're not called like, Indians or they're not called you know, Jews can be like of course ethnicity, but in terms of Muslims, um Muslims were used as like ethnic identifier or you know how that identity marker was working. Thank you. Yeah, so maybe I can uh, respond back to Julia and then also relate to what you say and perhaps if anybody wants to ask a question, they can raise their hand, stop me. I don't mind stopping. I just don't want to have a discussion just between the three of us, you know? Uh, so first, what Julia uh, was saying, um, yes, there is this kind of, you know, huge global history perspective that I think is very, it is very important to uh, think about it. Uh, I, I don't want to throw away the, the connected histories and there is still a lot to uncover about the connections that were lost. But I think that we should also account for the disconnections. And to be frank, I feel that in, in, a, in Sanjay Subramanian's work that we all admire and are grateful for his contribution, there is a kind of reluctance to admit, and, and Biderman really exposes it, you know, that Biderman confronts it. He says, no, there are a lot of disconnections that occurred during the colonial period, and we should start thinking about them and about their implications. And that's where I am reaching into the Judeo-Christian or Judeo-Christian Muslim heritage because it is, we, we have problems today <laughs> that emerge out of this history of disconnections. We have lots of misunderstanding of, about our past and our co connections in the past and all kinds of constructs that guide us today, like this idea of Judeo-Christian heritage. And especially to me, what it seems is the inter interconnectedness of this concept, this construct with, with the values of capitalism, you know? There is something there that I feel needs to be cracked. Now, I belong to religious studies uh, department. And as I said, I'm like an old time philologist. It's very different from the work of global historians. And you can see that there is tension between what you ask and what you comment and what Psycho says. And I'm trying to kind of put those two disciplines together in my work. It's a little bit of a struggle, but we tend to look at those questions about how religion operates in literature and in those networks and how it is related, at least I'm interested in that, how it is related to really material causes uh, like business and uh, trade networks. So to, to relate to what the Psycho was uh, commenting on, actually there is, uh, what you're talking about, Psycho, is what uh, Thomas Bauer is a scholar from uh, Munster. I gave this presentation in Munster first, uh, earlier this year, and he commented, actually, you are talking about disambiguation. And I said, what is disambiguation? Apparently, Thomas Bauer uh, uh, published a book a few years ago in German, in the German language, but it was translated into English just recently, published in English. It was translated in, into Arabic and uh, many other languages as well, Turkish. Uh, and he argues that in the Arabic speaking world, uh, the, the borderlines between literature and uh, legal uh, literature and religion, et cetera, et cetera, were not that clear cut and that uh, colonialism and Orientalism were uh, putting boundaries between those different entities. And I think a similar thing is happening also between religious entities. And that's what, what Indrani Chatterjee is talking about in her article about connected histories and the dream of decolonization, precisely that. And I think I can see it also in the history of the Malabar coast, where there is a specific period in which you see religious identities crystallize and emerge and become, you know, like fixed. And it becomes 
more and more fixed and more and more alienated to this kind of flows and fluidities uh, in the colonial period. So I think there is some kind of connection. And again, it's a work in progress and I wanted to discuss it and not to give conclusions uh, or to avoid being challenged. Yeah, I want those challenges in order to think further. But this is my hunch that there is an interrelatedness between the fixation of identities, of entities, and uh, uh, this new type of trade networks that basically help uh, colonialism to spread in such an effective way and help Europe to become such a, a great power in that period, financial and, and the military and the political power. And there is also the, the, your question about Portuguese. The Portuguese are marked as a political entity. That's, that's the point. You have mysticism, you have belief systems, you have messianic ideology, you have religious identities, but you have also a political power. And this political power is marked as uh, Portuguese. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, Halit? Oh, could you unmute? Yeah, now you can hear me. I, I, yes. Yeah. Okay. It is very interesting. I'm not uh, knowledgeable in depth about this subject, but uh, I can relate, relate it to what's going on nowadays in our area, uh, you know, the uh, I'm very much impressed with the idea of uh, what uh, Julia McClure said about connection, disconnection regarding the subject, because now our relationship here in the Middle East with Israel is changing. And uh, actually this goes back to, to the whole relationship with the religion, the Jewish religion and the connector between us, which is Christianity. Because this is how we view it. Uh, the, the, we are probably closer to the Jews, but we are connected with them, with the Christianity. Yet uh, we are disconnected, and now we are trying to be connected, uh, not really just religiously, but also politically. You know, a few days ago, there was a, 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 what they call it, the Middle East NATO, that they called it, you know which is an alliance between it happened in Israel between Arabs and United States, of course, and they're the species of the United States, but Arab and Israel due to a threat, of course, always like that. But uh, what uh, I want to mention as significant for this uh, Malabar Coast issue is the uh, Abrahamic house, which is being built or is already built in, uh, in uh, Abu Dhabi. In the, in the UA or Dubai, and uh, where where it has it connect between the three religions, the Christianity, Jews, and Muslim, and I think this uh, research by Ofera uh, will come in very, uh, I think, uh, helpful for for this kind of gathering because uh, they they will see what are the roots of this connection. Uh, between the Jews and the trader, the Arab traders, etc. As a matter of fact, before the Israeli-Palestinian coast, the relationship was totally different. <laughs> you know, um, it is true there was some enmity in the Quran or anything, but don't forget, and a lot of uh, us rely on the issue of what they call the Medina Accord, in which uh, in the beginning of Islam. Uh, Prophet Muhammad made an alliance between the Jews of Medina, Khaybar, uh, and uh, it's called Yathrib at that time, and then the the Muslim, the the Arab Muslim, and the uh, Arab non-Muslim, because at that time the majority were non-Muslims at that time. So he made an alliance to make uh, a, a, what they call a secular state under his guidance. As a matter of fact, it's very interesting, and I don't know if this is historically correct, has to be reviewed, but uh, the, 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 sit, the city itself, Medina, was not called Medina, was called Yathrib. And af after that, it's called Medina because Medania means secular, secu secularization in Arabic, Medani, civil. You know, Medina, uh, Medani civil, like even like civil engineer Arabic, Mohandis Medani, <laughs> you know. 
So it is very interesting, maybe the word connection. So I just want to add that and um, maybe it has a, somehow connects with what you are saying. Thank you. Thank you very much for this comment. Uh, there's another uh, comment there waiting, right, partially? Oh, uh, shall I take all or? or so, yes, and then, okay, yes. Oh, okay. So, um, partially, sorry, um, Harit can, oh, yes. Yeah, I just have two, well, quick questions because I'm involved in two projects. One is about um, actually working with the uh, Portuguese um, about the Anusim in India, specifically the Western coast, Southwest coast. Uh, I am from India, so I am passionate about this topic as well. Um, now we know that uh, there were a lot of Jews uh, that existed when the Portuguese came and your presentation today makes it very clear. You know, you give a lot of details. So I know a little bit more who existed before the Portuguese came. Uh, now, what do you actually think um, happened to the these Jews, all these Jews that lived there once the Inquisition started, the Goa Inquisition? If you have any thought about that. Uh, my second point is from a totally different perspective because I'm working on a cuisine and culture book with um, a Judeo-Arabic, um, recipe preser preserver and we are looking at the uh, influence of the Baghdadi origin Jews in India. So um, do you think that the Muslims then after the Portuguese came and there were this, there was this disconnection, did they go back to um, like Syria, Iraq, Yemen, wherever they came and did they come back again in the late 1800s? Were, you know, do you think that happened or like, do yeah. you know anything about that or? Yeah, I know a thing or two. Uh, is, is that what you wanted to ask? So shall I? Okay. So first to respond to Khalid uh, and then I will respond to your uh, comments. Uh, I think Khalid, when you go to the Israel uh, issue and the Israeli entity at, at the Middle East at the moment, it's not really my remit to be frank, but I am an Israeli, so I know it from that perspective. And I think that's where we can go back to Julia's remarks about the global history and capitalism and poverty and all those intersections between those issues and world systems and the material reality. I think it's very, very important to consider the material reality uh, when we look at the situation on the ground now because we are talking about uh, people being, you know, there are a lot of refugees still, and there are more and more refugees being produced uh, by the wars. There are a lot of issues around oil, and I think it's not a coincidence that uh, the United Arab Emirates, uh, you know, look for new connections with uh, Israel and, and that uh, kind of politics, because now oil is becoming more and more of a scarcity. So, we have to think about the future of energy and resources and connections within the region. Um, yeah, I'm, it's, it's, it's a very painful issue because um, in a way, one of the reasons I'm engaging with those questions is there is a personal issue here, to be frank. You know, I am of a Yemeni origin. My father and my grandfather, they were born and raised in Saada in northern Yemen. And the, you know, still there are books, you know, the genealogy of my family, of my father's family is buried in a well in Saade that is being bombed now in an endless war. Uh, so there are lots of countries that used to be at the center of those trade networks in the past with Malabar, with the west coast of India, and they are now devastated and in pieces because of the political entities that were produced during the 19th and 20th centuries. In, in the so-called Middle East, the term Middle East in itself is highly problem problematic. You know, it is from a Eurocentric perspective. If you look at it from India, in Indian papers, you don't hear Middle East. You hear news from West Asia, right? You look at our region from South Asia, it is West Asia, right? So why Middle East? It's another construct that is disturbing, to be frank, right? It is separating the Arabic speaking world from the rest, part, the rest of Asia. That was the Arabic world was connected to Asia in so many different ways. 
not only the trade networks. We, you know, I was, my training is an, as a Mindologist. I studied Sanskrit and I studied Malayalam and I studied Indian culture. And it took me quite a lot of years of training and study to realize that my discipline is completely disjoined from the Arabic speaking world. And that's weird, that's awkward. The earliest Sanskrit dictionaries were composed by Muslims, you know. Um, yoga, yoga was translated into Arabic in Yemen in the 15th century. Yoga that is now lost in the original Sanskrit. So the connections between Indian culture and the Arabic speaking world are completely severed in terms of disciplines, which is also very strange. And of course, the whole entity and identity of Arab Jews, what also Psycho mentioned, not only in Andalus, but also in the Arabic speaking world for so many centuries are completely displaced, severed and distorted. And not to say that everything was good and rosy, you know, it's not the point here to romanticize the past. So there were tensions, there were enmities, there, were, there was violence, there all kinds of things happened. But still, there are those connections between quite significant uh, groups of Jews, uh, their uh, intellectual leadership, et cetera, et cetera, that are completely forgotten now uh, and are you know, maybe known to a few scholars here and there, and that's about it. Uh, so that's, that's about, uh, I hope I responded to most of the points you raised. And uh, regarding partially what uh, you asked, I, I know quite a lot about that period. And I can tell you with a slight embarrassment, I don't want to sound haughty, but the story, the history of the Jews of the Malabar coast, as it is told in numerous articles and books, is just so orientalist and colonialist and racist that it is outrageous. The idea that there are black and white Jews, for example, in the Malabar coast is ridiculous. I can tell you that the port of Cochin, you see, in 1341, there was a flood uh, or tsunami or an earthquake, nobody knows what precisely, that the island of Kochi rose from the water. And in 1342, 1343, Ibn Battuta is stuck in Calicut. Uh, he, the ship, he had his concubines and property and slaves uh, on a Chinese vessel set sails because of a cyclone that hits the port of Calicut. He is left alone. He takes a boat ride through the river El Nahir, yeah, <laughs> probably the backwaters. He takes a boat ride from Calicut, very upset. He has a Muslim, local Muslim, carrying his prayer mat, you know, and he's upset with this local Muslim on the boat because the, Mus the Muslim drinks with his uh, Hindu buddies all the way and upsets, <laughs> upsets even Batuta. So even Batuta writes, "I'm upset. I'm gloomy." Oh, just Excuse me, there's somebody at the door. Thank you, guys. Uh, apologize, I tried to ignore it, but they continue knocking angrily. <laughs> so even Batuta writes, I feel cloudy, I feel upset. And the journey goes on and all of a sudden he reaches a place, he says it is called Kunjakari, which is Kochangadi, which is the old name of Kochin. He says, in that place, there is a group of Jews, the Yehud, <laughs> and they have their own emir, and they are paying taxes to al Tirvari of Kolam, right? They pay taxes to, and I'm thinking, you know, he's telling this story in the Maghreb, maybe 20, 30 years after the events. In all his travelogues, he's, he's, he mentions Jews only three times, at the Ottoman court, in Damascus, and in Cochin. Only three times, and all of Asia was popular. All the places he visited were, had lots of Jews. So there is a narrative function for the mention of Jews in Kunjakari, and he spells it. He says, you write it with kaf, with an wav, and with this, you know, he really accurately spells the name. And I'm thinking, why? Now, there is a Hebrew inscription that was found in, that, in a synagogue in Kuchin, Kadabumbagam synagogue, dated 1344 
So one year after Ibn Battuta passed by, right? I think what Ibn Battuta wanted to tell his Maghribi colleagues in this narrative, if you ever travel, you know, in that foreign land, there is a new market between Calicut and Kolam where you can do business with the Jews. That's what he's telling them. This is my reading. And the thing is that this inscription now is being pasted on the wall of the so-called Paradeshi Jews, the white Jews in Cochin, without telling where they took it from. And everybody says that this inscription belonged to a synagogue that Tipu Sultan burnt in Cochin. Tipu Sultan was a Muslim ruler from Mysore. Problem is that Tipu Sultan never reached Cochin. So he couldn't have burned any synagogue. And the other problem is that normally, you know, if you find, find a stone inscription in a certain synagogue or a, or a site, why should you attribute it to a different place? You see partially what I mean? And the other amazing thing is that this inscription is dated according to the Hebrew calendar of the European system of counting at the time, not Yemen and the East, Eastern Jews. That means that the Jews in the mid 14th century who established this synagogue in collaboration with local Jews came from, came from Europe. There was some capital coming from Europe with I think probably Italy, <laughs> by the way, probably that was the connection. But we have those connections between Jews from the Western Mediterranean, the Eastern Mediterranean, the Arabian Peninsula and Yemen, and the West Coast of South India. There were Jewish networks since the ninth century involving Jews, never mind where they came from. And the whole idea that there was some separation between Anusim, between uh, new Christians in uh, Cochin in the early 16th century is a fallacy. There is a scholar working on the Inquisition documents. And he, uh, I know him personally, I can't read Portuguese, and he says that all the new Christians uh, that came with the Portuguese were persecuted and executed by the Inquisition in Goa at some point. He says that two or three disappeared. The problem with his uh, uh, study is that he often completely messes up the dates <laughs> and the details. And this is a huge problem, you know? So, uh, Regarding the history of the Jews, uh, partially, and the Portuguese, and the new Christians uh, on the west coast of Malabar, uh, this is still a history to be properly investigated without belittling, diminishing, and erasing the, the Jewish networks uh, that established the Jewish communities of the Malabar coast. It didn't start in the 16th century, and the Jews of the region didn't have to wait for uh, Dutch Jewry to arrive in the 17th century to revive, you know, this isolation that, that uh, Julia was talking about. This is precisely what they do with the Jewish history of Cochin. The Malabar, the place that was so central in global trade in that period, is presented in that Jewish history as if they were isolated, you know, that, that's a big problem. And just to uh, also say something about the last point you raised about the Iraqi uh, Jews and the connections. Oh, there were ongoing connections with Iraqis, Syrians, North Africans. It's documented, Yemenites. Yemenites are completely erased from the picture, which is ridiculous. I found in a letter exchange between Rahabi, 18th century, Rahabi was from Iraq. He had Iraqi scholars uh, coming uh, to stay with him. He had connections with the Theosophic Society. It's a pity Menashe Anzi was, was here. He knows more about it, but he had to go to his own <laughs> uh, book launch. Uh, but uh, the Iraqis were not only the Baghdadis who came with the British uh, colonialism. They were there in Cochin since the Dutch period, actually, and even the Portuguese period. And I think that they were collaborating with the Portuguese. That's another thing that is being erased, you know? They were probably collaborating with the Portuguese and with the King of Cochin, and there were all kinds of things happening there that we have to 
keep our minds open, you know, to see what is there actually in the documents and not just romanticize the Jewish community of the Malabar coast. Uh, and um, the last thing about the, the Habi connection, uh, he had also Yemenites working with him. I have to bring in my own perspective. I'm sorry about that. But, you know, I read letter exchanges between a rabbi in Sana'a and uh, one of the Rahabis in the 18th century. And they mentioned two Yemenites working for this Rahabi who have the same names of my grandmother and grandfather from Yemen. <laughs> you know? So I felt like, oh my God, even my family members I can find there, you know, <laughs> on the bottom of our coast. So that's, that's on that note, I'll, I'll stop and yeah. Thank you very much, Ophira. Um, I think, um... Uh, it will be. It has to be like close to the end. So I would like to have like a final round of um, um, brief questions and also brief response. That would be great. And keep, keep, me, keep me short. I'm sorry, <laughs> I got carried away. <laughs> yes, Bernard. Um, if you could unmute. Yes. Hi. Um, first of all, thank you, Afira, for organizing this. And although we've never met, we are seventh cousins, but that's not something to discuss here. Um, I've got some specific questions. Um, I've been doing research into my Sephardic genealogy, and I discovered you through that because I kept coming across um, new Christians who had been Jews in Portugal, who ended up not just in Portuguese India, but as governors and viceroys. And of 104 governors and viceroys of Portuguese India, it looks like 70%, maybe 80% were new Christians. But of those, 30% are probably descended from Abu Hassan, the last Muslim Sultan of Granada. And in addition to that, I've just got a DNA match showing that my maternal DNA, um, which is found around India, originated or is believed to have originated on Socotra and off the south of Yemen. So I've got all these different mixtures, but my question is very specific. Um, clearly, the statement that you made before by this man who's investigating the Inquisition in Goa is not correct because the new Christians, some of them may have been executed as a kind of demonstration and sample, but most of them weren't. Most of them weren't anywhere in the Inquisition. Um, the apparent level of tolerance of the practice of Judaism by the Inquisition Portuguese in India seems to suggest that the new Christians who were actually administering Portuguese India were sympathetic to Judaism. And I wondered if you can say something, A, about that particular phenomenon, but also in uh, about the ways in which they then intermixed with the community. Because it seems to me that, as so many of the other speakers have already said, the separations that are written into the language that most people use daily are completely wrong. And... Um, we are all so much closer and cross so many borders if we can find out the information. And I wondered if you could say something about it. And I will be contacting you separately just because we are customs and I'd like to talk to you. Okay, thank, thank you. you very much, Bernard and Ophira, very briefly. And you can, of course, carry on your seventh cousins. Yes, <laughs> Please so, carry on. Privately. So very briefly, uh, it's a different uh, presentation and a different uh, lecture and a different subject altogether related. But uh, yeah, just uh, <laughs> to respect the time, I will just uh, stop there. But uh, yeah, and also there's a lot of that we don't know. We need proper historical research that hasn't been carried so far. So that's that's my response. But yeah, let's keep in touch. That would be nice. Okay. Thank you very much. And I think I would like to formally thank um, Ophira for this wonderful start of this lecture series. And I think um, the decolonizing knowledge and also this disconnection connection 
And um, also you mentioned like, you know, uh, disciplinary compartmentalization, the issue of um, you know, disciplinary um, separation as well. So like so many things, um, issues, um, uh, we would like to carry on discussing in this series. So the next one is um, 20th of April. Uh, that's my talk. And I'm talking about some clothing and politics and religion and in Japan. And the third one is 17th of May uh, by Dr. Mahmoud Kuria from Leiden University, uh, Assess of Malapuram, reading the Malaba rebellions differently. So thank you very much. And also Julia um, for your wonderful uh, response. And then I'm sure we can carry on our conversation um, together as well. And thank you very much everyone to join us and also your comment and discussion as well. Thank you.